Welcome to a very special edition in the SE Community Conversation Series. This series is a regular gathering that we host from SE International as a charitable offering for the world. And never has the context been more important than today's session. The series is designed to bring forward concerns in public health where we look at them through the lens of somatic experiencing. For this edition, which we've titled The Threat of War, Somatic Rebalancing, we will, unlike other community conversations, not be taking live questions. What's important to share is that we have already collected questions in advance for today from a diverse array of peoples and countries who have been or are currently being impacted by the threat of war, and that will be guiding today's session. Many of you are here from parts all around the globe, and we welcome you. We love that this series involves so many of you from everywhere. So I invite you to use the Q&A to go ahead and post now, if you like, where you're joining us from. Let us get a sense that this is not a series like other things you've been to where it's talking heads on a screen telling you how to do things, but rather let's enjoy this time together as an actual resource that we are in the presence of people who we'd love to eavesdrop on their conversation, that we get to be a part of a large gathering let yourself experience right now that you're here with others in this gathering. And so just let us know where you're at so we can see you and be with you. More importantly than anything else I might say about that is our guests who we're featuring tonight. We know you're as excited as we are for Dr. Peter Levine, the founder of SC International and our modality that means the world to everybody here, which is somatic experiencing. He will be in conversation with Dr. Abby Blakesley, who many of you know is faculty with SCI and legacy faculty with Ergos, the organization that provides master classes advanced beyond the basic SE training that we offer at SCI and at points around the globe. So Dr. Peter Levine, Dr. Abby Blakesley, Peter, Abby, if you'd like to turn on your video and join us on screen, I will step aside and let the conversation begin. But just on behalf of everyone who's attending and on behalf of SC International, thank you for being willing to step in this conversation on short notice. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So welcome, Peter. Welcome, everyone who's here. It's really nice to be together. And I've collected several really interesting questions. So I will be um, offering them to you, Peter. Um, and I've organized them um, through some different stages. So the, the collective piece here is that we're going to be talking about the threat of war. Um, the theme of living with war and feelings of dislocation and disconnection. And if we start kind of looking at, we have all kinds of global conflict occurring um, at many different levels. Some people are in the center of the conflict, 
Some people are supporting people who are fleeing conflict and war, and other people have experienced war, but they're not in an active war zone. And other people are far away from a war zone, but are feeling the impact of that. So I'm wondering if we sort of start from the edge and, and work our way in um, towards more active war zones. But for people who are not in an active war zone, just wondering if there are any insights from somatic experiencing that might be helpful for people to manage some of the, the threat and the overwhelm that they're feeling ongoing. Well, I, I think maybe a way of rephrasing their question is how can we help people find relative safety in the midst of war, trauma, upheaval, chaos, especially children who have this need uh, for parents to give them the feeling that things are going to be okay, that this is not going to go on forever. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to know where there's this kind of upheaval or chaos or trauma or war, I mean, just turn the BBC on for one day on the radio or the TV, and there's always something going on in, in this regard. And so again, is it possible uh, not to do therapy, but to help people and find this place inside of themselves where they feel some sense of stability and, and regulation and, and core regulation, and they can provide that for others and especially for children. So, um, so I mean, again, there's no shortage of areas where these kind of things would be helpful. But at the same time, I think we have to be careful not to go running into areas where uh, we're not supported, we're not uh, invited, we're not in part of this their support system. Uh, you know that I've seen that happen n numerous times where people come in with the with the good intentions of helping, but they actually wind up creating more chaos um, because again the basic needs haven't been taken care of, and those usually involve food, shelter, safety, some actual safety. So, um, so I think that's the first thing, really to check and make sure that it's an appropriate time to, to come in. You know, when we responded in the, to, in the Southeast Asian tsunami back, what it must have been 30 years ago, and, uh, you know, we waited until things were settled enough for us to come in. And then we worked with many people, for example, who had uh, developed uh, uh, quote, psychosomatic paralysis or blindness and especially children. And, but again, we were able to also help the teachers learn how to be with the children to help the children because really the teachers are the ones that the children are, are most connected with. So again, rather than, of course, to, 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 to uh, support the mental health system there, but in many cases, there is no real mental health uh, program there, but there are teachers, there are schools, and again, to help them, to give them the resources, to help them be able to ascertain where, where children are needing extra care and some of the tools that they can do with the kids, with play, with drawing, and particularly with um, uh, what's going on in the kids' bodies so that we can help them, again, come to some sense of settle. Um, so, so how's that for a start? Wonderful. Let's follow where you're moving and sort of supporting community leaders. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving more into talking about people who are either in areas of conflict after a war, or of course we have many people now, many refugees moving into other parts of the world. And what are some of the things um, that might help people to understand and support refugees from an SE perspective? Yeah, that's an important question. Because again, 
um, number of countries have been really generous in opening their borders, in opening their homes, in sharing their families. It's been really quite remarkable. It's just the opposite of the way it sometimes is when, um, you know, when there are refugees that are coming in. I think this is a, there's been a shift and, and, you know, and it's different. But again, the people who are welcoming the, 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 the people uh, from outside, that they, um, they really need, they need support because these people are coming in, they are gonna be traumatized and they need to understand some of the behaviors that go on when people are traumatized. You know, I was thinking about um, Germany back when the uh, refugees were coming from Syria, places like that. Uh, the, generously, they opened their borders and said, you know, come in, everybody come in. And I remember sending some emails to uh, some of the SE teachers in, in Germany and saying, please, if you're gonna do this, you've gotta find ways to again, help these people process some of their trauma or else it's gonna infect you know, the situations where they're coming into. And of course that happened, you know, there were these um, uh, young women were, I don't know if they were molested, but they were, they were, um, they were treated, you know, very poorly. But again, if you understand trauma, you understand where that's coming from. And if you help them originally, then you um, can reduce the likelihood of, of untold reactions. So part of it is, I guess you could say psychoeducation, what kind of behaviors, what kind of needs the traumatized people have and how can you triage that? How can you get help for, for, um, for refugees that really need direct help or how can you help groups um, together uh, uh, and, um, and to be able to know which is which. Is which. So, um, you know, again, I would say to the people who are inviting the refugees from coming in, and, and this is true, again, in many, many cases, not just in what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, but in many, many instances, to really be able to set up programs to support those people. Because, you know, I mean, trauma is infectious. That's one of the things we know, of course, about trauma. And so when the traumatized people are coming in, they're coming into these countries where there has been actually a lot of generational trauma from the previous wars, such as World War II, um, you know, uh, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna activate them. So how can they handle that? How can they get supported uh, together and with each other so that they're not swept away with the, with the traumatized um, emotions that are that are coming in, so it, it really has to happen at a number of different fronts, not yeah. just the people who are traumatized, but the people who are taking them in, who have earlier trauma, and then that's going to, you know, add to that and and reactivate a lot of those uh, memory engrams. So you know, you're you're talking about the sort of potentiation of trauma, you know, the, or the rekindling that can happen during these times of dislocation and disconnection and how important it is for the helpers, right? The people who are re-engaging with survival physiology at a very core level, being attentive to their own history, to their own transgenerational trauma, and really getting support from one another, hopefully doing SE sessions, being involved with their own groups. And then we have secondarily helping the people who have needed to flee and relocate and create a new life. Right. And right. I think it's important to eat in that order to first help prepare the people in the countries that are welcoming the refugees and to help them first. And it's something that we can do, that we will do, what we know how to do. And so to give them that support initially so that they in turn can better support the refugees who of course are in tremendous need of support, but also 
have tremendous resilience. I mean, that's true, of course, in so many, many cases, but resilience only can take you so far. You know, uh, yeah, people can be resilient, but they also can be traumatized. And so we really need to understand and be able to identify which is which and, and to continue to give the people support you know, because even some of them have even taken in refugees into their own homes and they're going to be exposed to their children. So how do you help their children so that they're not traumatized? And they can also, as part of a group, together to also help the refugees and especially the refugee children. So activities where they play together, where they draw together, where they sing and dance together. These are all important things to because the people are so shut down in their bodies, they need movement, they need expression. So doing things like this, which, um, which uh, bring uh, different kinds of movement-based uh, uh, experiences to, to the, the children to do it together and to do it with the families and to even do it with, their, with the folk songs from their, uh, you know, from their histories, because they all have this rich uh, warmth, and to be able to again to draw on that as a way of helping support the children, the families, and again especially the children that are coming in and that are really shut down. And again, that's one another reason why movement is so important, because so many of the people are in a state of shutdown. So they really need movement, they need expression to help move them out of the, out of the shutdown, out of the uh, states of, uh, of hypo arousal states of, yeah. So you're really talking about, you know, both from the biological level, right? We have the, you know, rhythm and movement to help with the shutdown. And then also there's this beautiful cultural component of staying connected to the cultural resources, continuing to build community, which is going to be more in that ventral state, right, where we're responding and, and right. helping to, you know, be regulated together, and the importance of, of really trying to foster that in, in various groups. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, once people learn to do it with each other, they'll be glad to share it with others. And that will involve uh, social engagement when they come out of the hypometabolic states and start to come back with active activity and, uh, and, 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 and the urge to connect social engagement system. Uh, as they do that, then that will also tend to help them bond and attach and deal more effectively when tra traumatic material comes up in the play or in you know, the different exercises and to really help them hold what they've experienced, you know, which in this, well, not in just in this case, in many, many, many cases where it's been such a profound um, challenge to people's well-being. Could you give a couple of examples of some exercises that one might use with children or adults? Well, you know, one of my favorite that I've learned from children is skipping. And kids love skipping and playing. And when they skip with each other, you'll see them spontaneously start to giggle. Uh, you know, we've actually done a number of different kinds of exercises with, with children. Um, Maggie Klein and I, we took one of the books we wrote uh, called Trauma Proofing Your Kids. And we, we modified it to be used in, in situations like this. Um, and uh, we actually, during the, the, uh, the Syrian um, disaster, uh, uh, we had it translated into, um, into the Syrian language. But we really need to get these translated into many, many different languages. And at this point, many of the European languages, because again, those are the people who are going to be, you know, working with these families or supporting these families. So hopefully 
we're trying to raise a little money to get these uh, to get this um, mini booklet um, uh, translated to different la uh, languages. You know, you you mentioned Syria here, and and there is a question about. Um, of course, there's so much dislocation from many areas, but what when somebody is dealing with a sense of abandonment from a refugee from a previous war, well, refugees from the current crisis are getting attention and support, but those refugees are still dislocated. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying. So in other words, people are getting the immediate attention because it's more of an acute situation. But then other the people have maybe experienced their traumas from an earlier time uh, in a different uh, in a different conflict. Is that is that what you're? Yeah, and and many refugees have experienced uh, a different you know whether it's been violence or there's been um, unwelcoming. Yeah, um, and in the Ukrainian. Uh, war right now, there's been a lot of uh, open borders. And so there's differential treatment that's been happening. Um, so many people, many refugees are feeling left behind, or they're feeling that um, they're, they're still feeling, they're feeling more and more abandoned is the part of this question here is, is, is there a way to support right. them? Um, because of this sort of feeling of the imbalance, yeah. imbalance yeah. Yeah, uh, I would say you have to do that. You know, otherwise it's going to wind up stirring up, uh, you know, uh, resentments that are going to mitigate against connection and social engagement. So I think you have to really look at the the history of those people, including um, generational trauma and also generational resources. But um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, you 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 have to you have to meet both issues, and it's and it's true. Often, you know, uh, people uh, who are in the more acute situation will get the help, and others that really, in many ways, it equally need help are not getting it because all of the focus is on the you know on the the, the acute uh, situation. So, I mean, it's not one or the other. I think you have to do both together and to be aware of how that might be playing out when these people are staying even at their homes or in their communities or in their churches, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, helping people to connect to the felt sense you know, internally, like you said, the transgenerational trauma and the transgenerational resilience and wisdom that's there and right. really building from where people are and creating those social connections in that continuing in the moment right. Right? and getting them the support that they need. That's right. I mean, a lot of this is about support. And, you know, uh, if you have a, a, a foundation that's kind of shaky, you know, everything that's built on that is also gonna be shaky. So really, really need to build a foundation of all of the part, people who are involved in the healing process. Uh, again, not just the, the ones where there's been an acute need. So um, to, to work together and also when you do that, I think people will have more com self-compassion, but especially more compassion for each other because they recognize they all are uh, sufferers from trauma and, and really that they can heal together. And when people begin to heal together, I think that's when the deep healing really begins. Peter, I have another question as you're talking about healing together. Um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues here in the United States, but from other places from Ukraine who have family in Ukraine. Um, and of course, people who have just left Ukraine, you know, I've been thinking a lot about there's a book called The Invisible Thread. It's one of these children's books that, that you read and 
the idea is when the kid goes off to school, there's always, or they're away from the, the family, there's always an invisible thread that still connects you, right? And you can oh, always like trace that, that back, yeah. right? Through the, the I, I think of it almost like, you know, heart to heart rainbows or something. Right. Um, but there's this yeah. feeling of, of um, when we have loved ones, people that we're dearly connected to, and even when they're far away, there's that invisible thread. That's right. And That's there's right. a lot of feelings of guilt, of yeah. of not being there, of not being able to mobilize in the way that people want to, um, of feeling scared, right, or mm -hmm. sad. So I'm just wondering if you could talk to yeah. some of that, well, we might call it survivor guilt or the, the challenge of that. Well, I mean, there's always survivor's guilt because many people didn't escape, many people got killed. Uh, maybe even very close uh, family or relatives or friends were killed. So survivor's guilt is going to be, it's always a factor. It's always an important factor. But I like the idea of the invisible thread. Actually, one of the things I did in a, in a workshop I, I did in Germany last year was called uh, Energy Fields and the Ancestors. And we actually took yarn, different colored yarn, to thread between the different ancestors and again, these were there were not invisible threads. They, threads they were visible threads, but they were making this invisible, invisible, energetic connection. So I think things like that again can be part of games that we play. And again, the book that uh, or the the booklet that Maggie and I wrote has a lot of those kinds of games that um, people can uh, do with each other. And. Uh, and, uh, and, and making those invisible threads visible so that we feel those connections to, to our ancestors and their connection to their ancestors. And again, many of the people from this, that, that area of the world, talking about Ukraine, of course, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, so much has gone on there in the way of upheaval you know, um, after the after the Second World War, that um, you know that those are still left in many cases unresolved. So again, I think those are the things we want to look at as being the invisible forces or the energetic forces that are playing on these people in the here and now, but come from the there and then. Yes. So what could someone do if they're feeling that um, dulling of their own life force, you know, or, or a feeling of, of sure. guilt um, that they're not with their loved ones? Are, are there some somatic tools that you might yeah. offer yeah. or insights? Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's, it's essential to help people come out of the um, uh, hypometabolic states, the states of hypoarousal. Hypo because otherwise they're really not able to participate because they're shut down. So I do things again with the VU and with movement and, you know, it, and making boundaries and, you know, these kinds of things. So again, they obviously weren't able to do that with all of the bombs and explosions and everything else that's going on, but still their bodies would have needed to do those things, would have wanted to do those things, and of course were unable to do them. So when you help instill them, then I think again, people are able to step back and instead of being swept up by the trauma, be able to look at the trauma and, and look at what they share with those that they're, that they're with, that they're around, you know, and, I'm thinking specifically of the families that have taken many of these people in, taken many of the teachers, and then many of the teachers, because it's important that the kids can go back, can get into a school situation. But again, they, uh, most of them don't know the language. So again, the, you know, giving the teachers even some specific tools of games they could play so that those kids can begin to learn Polish or Hungarian or you know, uh, 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 Croatian, and um, and again to make a game out of it, and, and have the 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 young people from Poland to play with those children, because children really instinctively know how to help heal other children, and they do it through play, they do it through dance, they do it through rhythm, 
They do it through making threads and, and, and playing with threads and connecting with each other. So there's so many, so many things that can be done, really, really so many things. Well, I feel some a feeling of hopefulness welling up in me as you talk about right that that spontaneous nature that children have to find resiliency and different possibilities you know that teachers can do communities can do um certainly to sort of prevent trauma right the right. sort of the, the passing along of right. um, these very challenging times um, do you have any other suggestions for some of the adults um, in a war zone, in an active war zone? So if somebody is still in an active war zone, what what possibilities might we have from a somatic perspective yeah. to support them? Well, again, you want to help them find, I don't use the word safety, the term safety, because there is no safety when things are like going on but something more akin to relative safety. And again, that is really mostly about being able to feel in the body where they feel something that's even slightly more safe, slightly more settled and to practice that. Because, you know, again, we, we, we shouldn't make the mistake that we're gonna help them find safety because they're not experiencing safety, but they do have the potential to experience something that where they feel safe enough to not be overwhelmed, to not be overwhelmed and paralyzed in fear. Yeah, so, so in some ways, you know, it sounds to me like you're talking about finding some kind of internal place a relative pocket of safety that's right maybe even in between you know shelling that's going on where you can feel your feet or yeah, yeah. right touch a tree yeah. um and then feel some solidity or mm -hmm. uh, just a yeah. small amount yeah. of reorganization or down regulation yeah. is that and many that? children probably most children have pets or um you know stuffed animal pets and to um to have them be with their stuffed animals and help and and help the stuffed animals get calm mm -hmm. so that they can practice it with their you know with the, with their with their um with their playmates but they're you know the stuffed playmates uh, i think that's something that's you know that's very do doable you know again kids will you know at times like this they will hold on to these, uh, to these stuffed pets. And when they do that, it makes them feel more settled, more calm. So use that as a way to finding in their body where they feel that sense of relative safety, relative calm. And then to also hold their, 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 their playmates there, their, and uh, to be able to sing to them, to be able to play with them, to be able to dance with them, to be able to, to tell them that it's gonna be okay, that it's really scary right now, but it's gonna be okay. So they can speak that to the, you know, to their, to their stuffed animals. And I'm, I, I've done that with kids and it's remarkable when they do that, you know, this has been like after fires or earthquakes or tsunamis, you know, kids really, they really attach to, um, to, their, to the, their stuffed animals. And they, then the stuffed animals really help provide that which they need to feel some sense of safety, some sense of it's not okay right now, but it won't go on forever. And that's really an important one. It's scary now, it's really scary, and it won't go on forever. Yeah, yeah. well, you must realize we just had a big stuffed animal party downstairs before I came here. <laughs> it was very fun. But yeah. you know, it's that, it's that 
the nurturing or the calming that stuffies have, but as they go into the role play, I've often thought about that as sort of taking back agency, because if they become the comforter of the stuffy mm -hmm. that is scared, yeah, and in some ways they have some agency around being offering that care. There's something that's mobilized in that. Right. Well, I mean, they're doing it to themselves via their their stuffies. Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, it's when they when they're helping the stuffies settle. That's really what they're doing. They're helping themselves regulate, mm -hmm. and it just it, it works best best when it's by proxy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. So let me take another look here at some of the different questions. Um, let's talk a little bit about helping the helpers some more. Yeah. You did mention how important that was. Right. And when there's such deep need, of course, mm -hmm. many of us rise to to, to respond to be present, um, to, you know, offer our support. And so there can be sometimes some hyper mobilization, um, over activation mm -hmm. in the, the serving of others or yeah. difficulty to right. um, find those places to regulate oneself. Yeah, yeah. So have some uh, suggestions for the helpers that are right, needing right, to mobilize, right, right. but right. also maybe needing to have some new tools yep. to step back and to re re-regulate yeah. sure well self-care is essential uh otherwise the whole thing uh, implodes on itself you know uh when we were uh in thailand after the tsunami you know at the end of each day we would go to the beach and one of the se people that there was a uh, qigong teacher and so he did qigong with all of the with all of the, the SE therapists every day. And then at that time, people would talk about, you know, what, what their day was like, what kind of things they had to deal with. So, I, I mean, you, you're 100% you're right on that self-care is essential. I mean, therapists often don't even, in their normal practice, don't do self-care you know, and they've had a rough day and they don't often don't move around and take a walk and kick some uh, cans down the road. I, I remember that's what, when I would do that's when I was seeing people in Colorado, I would be cooking, a, kicking a can down Apple Valley Road. And so some of the neighbors would be saying, oh, that's Dr. Levine. It's just Dr. Levine again. He must've had a difficult day. <laughs> So again, to do something active and to be with each other. Uh, you know, I think if we don't see that as uh, essential, then we're gonna really diminish our capacity to be effective in working in these difficult, difficult um, situations, because they are, I mean, people are highly traumatized. They've experienced tremendous amount of loss. They, um, you know, uh, they're developing all kinds of symptoms, not just emotional symptoms, but physical symptoms. So again, to continue doing active work, to move, to, to sing, to chant, to vu, to vu and ra, to do it together and to do it together in a group and then to be with each other in helping move stuck energy through. Mm -hmm. There's also, you know, that term compassion fatigue um, that's out there. And I, I'm wondering, because at least I know for me working with trauma, how important it is for me to track my own body and physiology yeah. in a right. session, you know, when there's flight energy or there's right. a near death experience or, you yeah. know, it's sort of to, it's to be in the resonance, but also to regulate similar you know in some other way where i'm staying anchored and present um right. i'm just wondering if you have any suggestions yeah. about ways yeah. that we can be in our own bodies or physiology right, right. in the presence of such yeah. uh, the threat of war right well you know i would rather than call it um compassion fatigue 
would call it fatigue of um, not getting self care. Mm. And I mean, we have to do that. And it's something that we really can't do very well alone. We need others to be present with us and we can share in that rule. So I think rather than compassion fatigue, it's the fatigue of not getting that compassionate reflection from others that we really need as part of the, the what it, it really it means to be a human being dealing with these exigencies and, and traumas and things that uh, affect whole populations and whole societies. You know, if we don't do this, uh, I, right at the end of the, the uh, former Yugoslavian war, you know, I was part of a, a, a peace mission that was working there right at the end of the war. And, you know, it was, and I worked with a number of, especially with the adolescents, you know, who had been traumatized. But, you know, it was always in the back of my mind that if we don't help these kids that, and, and the age that they are, then in another 10 years, there was going to be another war because that's what unresolved trauma does. It, it keeps capitulating, recapitulating itself in, re, in repetition not just uh, individual repetition, but of the whole society's uh, repetition. So it's, it's really, really, it only makes sense to see things in that way because without that, it will just be, we'll, we'll just repeat, we'll repeat and we'll repeat and we'll repeat. So when, when someone is, you know, sitting with someone who's, we feeling, let's say, emotionally dislocated or disconnected. I mean, we've talked about physical dislocation and disconnection. Yeah. Can you talk more about that emotional dislocation and disconnection with the threat of war? I mean, and that could happen whether it's right. we're in the midst of it or we're more peripheral to it. Right. I mean, we all live under that specter that there could be a war. I mean, again, in this situation right now, you know, people are talking about their fears of of World War III, yeah. of you know, of a of a Holocaust, of a nuclear Holocaust, and it may not be literally very likely, but that's a lot for people to be holding. So again, we have the shared fear that we need to find a way to settle ourselves so that we're not expending extra, extra worry, energy on the worst possible catastrophe that could happen. I mean, again, which is a thing that traumatized people usually do is they, it's the, they, they engage in catastrophic thinking, but catastrophic catastrophe here could be, you know, uh, life, uh, destroying. So again, how to how to settle ourselves so that we realize when we're spending unnecessary worry energy, and yeah, yeah. So when when you notice that you're expending unnecessary wor worry energy, right? Just having more tools for people to notice constriction or hypermobilization or you know this is kind of that swirling dysregulation that might be driving some of those behaviors and then having some tools right. to reorganize right. that yeah yeah again you know we're talking about bottom uh top-down processing so that's really looking at thoughts and trying to become aware of the thoughts and the effect that the thoughts have on us but the other hand with somatic experiencing in particular we're working bottom up so i think it's necessary to do both to do bottom up work which are the kinds of exercises the voo the jaw the boundaries bottom up but also to work top down with the thoughts and then to be able to settle and look at the thoughts and be able to say hmm is this something i really need to be worrying about right now or is this something that I can just let go and 
again, to, to not just work with the thoughts because you know, that's limited. The cognitive part is useful, helpful, important, but it's also limited. So to work with the two together, I think can get us out of this catastrophic mindset that really immobilizes us in an effective, um, in effective uh, response. Again, especially to people who are in such profound need of our support when we're settled. So we're not going to really be able to help settle them unless we are uh, settled in ourselves. And we really need each other to help settle ourselves and share that with the other so that we can be present with the people who are in this acute state state of, uh, of, uh, of immediate threat, of acute threat. So, I mean, that's always uh, the rule number one is what's going on with us? How can we settle? And when we settle, how can we then help others settle? So instead of going in an escalating, um, in escalating uh, downward spiral, we start to come on back up and, um, and be able to be present within ourselves, to be regulated, to calm ourselves so that then we can help calm others. And it, we need to start with us. That's always the case. I mean, as therapists, we need, first of all, to be working on our own stuff because when we work with our clients and you know their stuff is in some way similar to us, then we lose our capacity to be objective, to be, um, to be grounded with them and, and with their issues. But it's even more true, true when this is happening to a whole population of people. So really, we have to again use a very, very simple basic principle of SE is to regulate, to downregulate, to help each other, to support each other, and then to support others to help them downregulate and to help their children regulate. Because again, we don't want the kids to be carrying on to the next generation, the legacy of war and trauma and war because we know where that's gonna go, more, more of the same. Yeah. So I know that there's been a lot of outreach happening right now to help the helpers, different stabilization tools and SE that we teach, you know, orienting, grounding, mm -hmm. self-contact, yeah. movement, VU, there's the, the hug boundary work, you know, some of those things that you've mentioned. Um, and then you also mentioned, of course, making sure that people have, if they're coming out of a conflict zone, some of those basic needs are the most important things. And then you also have these internal ways to begin to regulate. Can you talk a little bit about um, helping people to find resources or joy even amidst suffering? Yeah. or fear, you know, yeah. what, what, what happens when you have, you know, as, as uh, we talk about the tension between the opposites, yeah. right, from a Jungian perspective? Well, you know, joy is a natural state. And even when you're dealing with trauma, as people are able to be guided to move through trauma, there unexplainedly, sometimes just out of the blue comes spontaneous joy. And it's just because it's a natural state, you know, and it's, it's always there. It's there for the asking, especially if we know how to ask. So, um, and again, children so naturally go to joy. Again, when they're playing, you know, different games with each other, the when they're jumping and skipping and singing to each other. That's about joy, you know? And um, again, joy is as, is, is as natural as trauma is unnatural. That's probably not really true, but it, it's as natural as trauma is natural. And it's a very powerful force in healing. So we can enlist it. and. I think you you mentioned it at one time that of course 
this could also bring up survivor's guilt because what right do I have to feel joy if others are, you know, are, are feeling, are not feeling that. And in working with a lot of um, veterans over the years, you know, uh, as generally when you're doing SE work, you do move towards joy, but often the joy gets shut down it just faster than it comes up because of the survivor's guilt. Because what right do I have to feel good when so many of the people I know are in, in a horrible situation? So it, it's, a delicate, it's a delicate balance to be able to hold the two of them together as polarities, joy on the uh, trauma on the one hand and joy on the other hand. I had an image um, just just while you were talking of kind of like a quilt, you know, stitching together mm -hmm. some moments of okayness or just a moment where we take in a relative pocket of safety or right. a child laughs and I hear the melodious sound of the laughter and then that there's some kind of imprint, right? And then stitching that, those moments together like a quilt that builds more and more, you know, of a pattern over time. Yeah. And I think that's one of the great gifts of SE is that we do focus on um, trauma, but we also really focus on this, this counter vortex or, or helping people to really come present within those moments where there can be some kind of shift that creates more of that rhythm. Right. I mean, I think this is what you're talking about is really the fabric of humanity. And there are many, many threads. There are threads of pain and suffering. There are threads of joy and exaltation. And how we weave them together into this thread of the human condition really, I think, is what determines the outcome of people's lives, that they're able to find healing, not only within themselves, but in community. And, um, and it's this fabric, I think, that's really where the healing occurs. It's not all good. It's not, it's not certainly not all good, it, but it's also not all bad. There's there's some of each. And again, they're woven together in this, in this complex, beautifully colors. I mean, you talked uh, before about the, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Um, the invisible threads. And these are the threads that connect us all and connect us all in this drive towards healing, towards wholeness, that again is part of our basic yearning as human beings. And to connect with that yearning is, is very important in the healing process, both individually and collectively. You know, as you're saying that, and I, I think we're getting close to, to our time, um, I'm heard that there were over 800 people who signed up to be here um so you know we have less people here on the call but that us just shows the amount of yearning openness um agency and the connection that we have in our somatic experiencing yeah. community to have so many people interested and i'm sure many people will be watching the recording of this afterwards. And I see Ame, you came on. It's nice to see you. Um, but it's really been an, an honor to be here. And Peter, thank you for your, your wisdom and your insight and your support. Yeah, anyhow, what, what you're just saying, I would say um, we would hope so. We would hope again that these are the cataclysm, cataclysmic events that bring people together. And particularly speaking to our, um, our cohort, the people from the somatic experiencing community who are drawn to help not just individuals, but help to alleviate the specter of war and violence and suffering that we see and, and, and come to the capacity for, for 
healing and and wholeness. So I again wish you all so very, very much in the way of helping others and and supporting yourselves with helping uh, others together to support each other and to um, really uh, help the people who are in such need uh, in this situation, but in, in many other situations as well. And you know, I'm gonna end with one more thought. What we do is we tend to only deal with things when they happen. We don't prepare, We're not, we don't look at things before and prepare for eventualities. I was thinking, uh, you know, after 9-11, uh, I was part of a, uh, of a counterterrorism think tank where a group of us met together. It's about 25 people in a, a secret government laboratory. And uh, um, my job was to, um, to reduce panic among populations. But a number of things came up in these discussions about what they thought the next threat could be from. And we, and we made a report, was sent into the um, Homeland Security and absolutely none of them were acted on and all of them did occur and we only acted until it was after an afterthought, it was, it was too late. Well, I mean, it wasn't completely too late, but you know, for example, one of the things we wrote that really needed to check people's shoes because they could easily put an explosive device on the, on the bottom of their shoes, which of course, that was one of the things that happened. But again, in this situation, we wanna prepare, we wanna be ready, we wanna have our, uh, our things in, 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 in preparation, things ready to go so that we can you know, go on our computer, click something and you connect with each other in a, and to be able to support the next uh, issue, the next, um, uh, area of violence because we're already organized in order to do that. So I think it's really essential that we we plan ahead rather than at the last minute try to respond to these these issues. Um, yeah, and that again that there's uh, you know uh, that somehow you can just click. And then um, many, many people are brought together to look at what kinds of skills they can provide, what kinds of skills they need, what kind of languages they know, et cetera. This falls right into what, Ame, you're organizing. Yeah, I love, this is, everything you've said, Peter, just resonates so much with everybody who's attending. and. You know, we've been developing some crisis stabilization and safety programming for emergency responder preparedness, exactly what you just said, but realizing that, you know, in a way we're all emergency responders, you know, I, I mean, no dishonor to first, first responders, but there's a way it's like, if something happens in your family, you're going to respond. And so preparedness for everyone is so essential. I just so appreciate that you just said that we just came from the emergency operations center working on preparedness. So I think that's an incredible place for us to wrap up. And also it it would go, yeah, it, it just wouldn't be right to not say, Peter, thank you so much because we're able to gather because of what you've given us. You know, yeah, Abby, part, gosh, thank you for world, And you're part of the world, Amy. You know, when there's a hurricane coming in, it really would be pretty inefficient to then try to get together people that would meet in a bunker and that would then give advice. Because in other words, you have to have that already ready to go. That's right. And I think we, we really need to use that same model in our response to, um, to threat. To all threat. Well, exactly. And, and thanks to you, Peter, you know, there's so many different disaster and crisis response programs that are unfolding, but also thanks to you, this program exists where we can come together in a series as a gathering you know, all of you who are with us tonight, thank you for being with us. I hope you feel that this is, this is conversant. This is a gathering with, 
with the father of our modality, Peter, we can gather thanks to you. It's much appreciated because because we do gather and we do talk amongst ourselves. And on a monthly basis, on the second Good. Friday of every month, here's your little commercial. Good. You're all invited to gather in our in our community conversation series because we love hearing from you, talking with you, showcasing what different SEPs and students are doing in the world with this work. You're making a difference. And so really want to acknowledge everyone who's attending want to acknowledge the many people who made this possible, who asked for us to do this, especially the SE Ukraine task force who are working so diligently to align so many different efforts and really doing a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, I'll take the liberty to say our minds, our hearts and our prayers and our cares are, are with you from everywhere. And also with every survivor of war and everyone experiencing the vicarious concerns. You've got, you've given us a real gem that, that, spans time in this conversation you two like so really thank you um in so many ways and if anybody would like to participate in any of the programs around public health we're doing from sei please do email us at public health at traumahealing.org and stay tuned on the ergos website as well as traumahealing.org for se training as a special thank you to anyone who's attending tonight who is not currently an se student or practitioner We'd like to give you access to a live basics training. Um, it's our way to keep bringing you this in a charitable way to make sure everyone has some access. So email us at publichealth at traumahealing.org and we'll get you that code to get on. Um, as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say? Say in closing, just a thank you. I, I can't say thank you enough, so I'm just gonna stop that and just boom, broadcast it as much as I can from my heart to both of you. This has been an extraordinary time together. Great, good. All right, well, walk tall. Uh, walk tall. And that's, you know what, walk tall, stretch your spine. That's gotta be doing a lot in there just to practice walking tall. Take that as another practical tactical access to okay. resilience. Okay. Thank okay. you, Ame, thank you, Peter. Thanks to everyone and all the wonderful work you're doing in the world. Thank mm -hmm. you.